You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and welcome to Episode 19 of the Crisis in the Church series. Today, we're going to dive into the Second Vatican Council itself with Father William McGilvery. This is the first of three episodes on the Council. After having reviewed the preparation for the Council in our last two episodes, today we will see what happened during the first session in the first year and a half or so of the Council. We'll see how the neo-modernists came to the Council absolutely prepared and, in effect, caused the first session to end with nothing accomplished, and how a group of Council Fathers, the Rhine Group, would go back home after the first session and prepare to reshape the course of the rest of the Council. If you'd like to learn more about this series we're doing on the crisis in the Church, or go back and revisit our previous 18 episodes, or if you want to support this project, please visit sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Now, we'll turn to our conversation with Father McGilvery. Welcome back to the SSPX podcast and the Crisis in the Church series. And we are welcomed for the first time with by Father William McGilvery. Hello, Father. How are you? Very well, thank you, Andrew. How are you? Very good, thank you. And for those of our listeners who are not familiar with you or who you are, uh, would you mind introducing yourself a little bit? Uh, tell everyone a little bit about uh, who you are. Sure. So my name is Father William McGilvery. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona was raised in a Novus Ordo family, but we found tradition when I was about 10 years old. Um, I went to a few different traditional schools. I went to Our Lady of uh, Sorrows Academy in Phoenix for just two years. That was for junior high. Um, and then I did go for just a brief period of time to La Salette, but I actually ended up finishing my high school um, at Veritas Preparatory Academy, which is a local charter school in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, Immediately after high school, I went to the seminary and I studied for seven years, um, first in um, Winona, Minnesota, and then afterwards in Dillwyn, Virginia. Um, One of those years was actually spent doing apostolate in Guadalajara, Mexico. And so at the end of those seven years, I was ordained a priest in June of 2019. And then immediately I was assigned to New Hamburg here in Ontario, Canada. Fantastic. And what are you doing in New Hamburg right now, Father? What are your duties there? Well, it's a very special apostolate because we have a uh, young growing parish with about 350 parishioners. Our main apostolate here is the boarding school. Not many people may be aware, at least those in the United States, that we do have a fairly large boarding school in Canada, um, which is called Our Lady Mount Carmel Academy. We have about 50 boarding students in grades 7 through 12, all boys. And we also do have a small day school for elementary children at at our church, St. Peter's Church in New Hamburg. So we both take care of the elementary school as well as the the high school, which is um, almost all composed of boarders, and then our usual parish work as well. And it's Very just good. a small priory. The three of us, uh, Father Stannis, um, myself, and then Father Rion, is our new priest from Switzerland, just ordained this last year. Very good. Well, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat with us about this. And uh, we are, we're going to be following up with what we did with Father Loop last time. And that is, uh, we'd, we've already talked about the preparatory period of the council. And now we're going to dive into uh, the council itself. We're not going to try and fit the entire sure. Second Vatican Council into one one episode here, I don't think. Um, but could you give us just a just an overall view of of the council? Why why this started to come about, and and you know what we've already talked about again? What led up to the council? But mm-hmm. as the council starts, what's the mood of the church? Well, it's an excellent question. Um, we could start by asking why was the council convened, and in fact, that's. Um, really, it remains to this very day, to some extent, a mystery. Um, it was, let's say, uh, supposedly a sudden inspiration from above that, that appeared in the mind of Pope John the Twenty Third, um, And without having consulted anyone, all of a sudden he announced that it was his intentional intention to call an ecumenical council. Um, The curious thing is that there was no specific uh, heresy or error that he intended to combat by means of a council. Uh, Usually in the history of the church, the ecumenical councils are kind of like uh, desperate last minute measures um, to to stop a heresy which is spreading and and, uh, posing grave harm to souls, threatening the very life of the church. And the ecumenical council is like the last resort. Uh, Nothing else has worked, so now we have to call everyone together um, and define very clearly what is the the Catholic teaching on this or that particular issue. Um, What's quite curious with the calling of the council by Pope John the 23rd 
is that uh, he himself says, uh, we might not agree, but he says there are no, no major errors that need to be combated in the church today. Everything is fine. Um, really, the main problem is that the church is out of touch with modern times and is failing to speak to modern man in a way that uh, he understands and identifies with. Um, so it's necessary to have a kind of aggiornamento or updating in the church. Um, in fact, I believe there's an episode where um, one of his cardinals asked him, um, Holy Father, what is it that you want to do at this council? And in order to answer him, the Pope didn't say a word. He just went to the window and opened it up as mm. if to say uh, that the church is stagnant. It's old and we need to let some fresh air in. Wow. So so this is, again, something something unique uh, very much in the history of the church. Um, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm thinking back to, again, the very first episode that we did uh, with Father McFarland and, and talking about the crisis in the church. And we're used to talking about the crisis in the church, but at this point, there really was no crisis in the church. There was certainly modernism. There was certainly neo-modernism prop, popping up, but there was not really this crisis in the church. There was no reason for this. Sure. I mean, let's say at least that the crisis wasn't evident. You could say that it was right. it was there kind of latent, like a, a spring that's coiled, coiled up and waiting to be released. But let's say in the in the vision of the Pope himself who called the council, there was no crisis. It was something that was not apparent to them. It would only become apparent shortly afterwards when all of the bishops of the world come together and it becomes evident that there are some who are very liberal minded and who want to transform the church in a way which isn't compatible with her, her apostolic origins. Now, could we talk a little bit, Father, about how a council works? It's very different from, say, national convention, something like that, um, where they come, they meet for a few days, and then it's done. Uh, councils are done over a very long period of time, and there's usually multiple sessions. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, in the case of the Second Vatican Council, there were four sessions, each of which, which took place uh, between the months of September or October uh, to December of each of the four years of the Council, so 1962, 1963, 64, and 65. Um, and that's fairly standard. The First Vatican Council, for example, um, only lasted uh, about a year, but that's because it was cut short by the invasion of Rome by the, the Freemasonic forces. Um, and so that's rather an anomaly, but usually an ecumenical council can, can last easily a number of years. Um, I believe the Council of Trent, for example, it, it lasted a number of years before it was interrupted and then reconvened later on. Um, so it's, it's usually something that uh, drags out over a significant period of time um, because, of course, there are grave issues to be discussed and everyone's opinion needs to be heard. Um, and this was even more so the case with the Second Vatican Council, um, since by far it had the greatest uh, numbers of, of um, uh, representatives or, or bishops coming throughout uh, from, from all over the world. Uh, at the Second Vatican Council, there were about 2,400 Council of Fathers, um, which is well over twice the amount um, that were present at Vatican I, and, and even that was much larger than any prior Council. So as we, as we move through these recent Councils in, in Church history, each one is much bigger than the previous one, and therefore requires um, more organization, uh, a more complex administration, and uh, lots of time needs to be given to debating each of the documents before it's proposed as something definitive. Who, who makes up a council, Father? Is it all the bishops in the world? Are, are they invited? Is it certain people are, are chosen? Well, it's an excellent question. Um, if it's an ecumenical or worldwide council, in, in principle, all of the bishops of the world would be invited. Um, obviously, that's a practical impossibility. It's sufficient that the, the bishops of the world be represented by some kind of a, let's say, um, moral majority or, or let's say a sufficient number so that you can say morally speaking uh, the entire the entire world is represented um, but what's essential is that uh, well there be a certain representation of the bishops of the world but joined to the Pope who's the head of the council and who guarantees its infallibility okay and so these these bishops or cardinals or you know all the all the bishops are given some sort of an idea ahead of time they're given some preparatory documents here here's what we want you to bring to the table essentially 
Absolutely. Obviously, it would be <laughs> it would be a mess, really, if all the bishops were invited. And then on day one, the floor was just opened up and you started asking around, well, what do you want to talk about today? Right. <laughs> what are we going to define today? Um, right. It's necessary for there to be what we call preparatory uh, schemata, which means that bishops, cardinals, important clergymen, members of the curia are selected by the pope in advance and entrusted with the task of preparing documents which are going to form uh, the basis of discussion at the beginning of the council. And those documents can be taken as they are and accepted. They can be tweaked, amended a little bit, or they can be rejected altogether. I don't know if, if it was something that ever happened before Vatican II that, that the preparatory schemata were altogether rejected. But as we're about to see as we go over the, the history of the first session of the council is that the liberal-leaning bishops from especially uh, Germany, France, uh, Belgium, and the Netherlands are going to form a kind of alliance, which we call the European Alliance or the Rhine Group, and they're going to, let's say, exert pressure on the council, and uh, ultimately, their objective at the beginning will be to throw out the preparatory schemata because they are precisely too conservative, too much in line with the church's doctrinal tradition, and they don't give room for let's say, what they would call progress in the, in the liberal sense of the term. Sure. Uh, that's fascinating already. Um, all right. So let's talk about the opening of the council, the, the first session. So we're, we're getting into October of 1962 here. And mm -hmm. how does the council open? Does the Pope make a statement or... Yes. So Pope John the Twenty Third gave an opening speech, which uh, is very important to study because it did really set the tone for the council. Um, we've already said that the Pope's motive in, in calling the council was something new. It was no longer to uh, combat heresy um, and condemn error, um, but rather he was hoping for an updating of the church and to somehow make the church um, more acceptable to the mentality of modern man. Um, at the same time, there were certainly warning signals being given from different parts of the Catholic world, and the Pope in his opening address wanted to kind of address um, those those warnings that were being given from various quarters. Um, we might recall even that back in the time of Pope Pius XI, Pope Pius XI had asked his cardinals would it be a good idea to call an ecumenical council, and it was Cardinal Beale who told him, no, don't do it because there are serious divisions in, in the bishops throughout the world. And there are some who are uh, modernist or liberal leaning, and they would use an ecumenical council to bring their, their modernist ideas into the church. It would not be prudent to call one. And then we have, of course, the warning of Our Lady of Fatima contained in, in the mysterious third secret, which wasn't yet published, and, and it seems still has not been published in its entirety, where Our Lady seems to warn about the danger of a uh, apostasy within the church and even in the, the highest members of her hierarchy. And this third secret we know was, was shown to Pope John the Twenty Third. Um, let's say, to be revealed by him in the year 1960. This is what Our Lady had asked of him. Um, and, and we're told by, by cardinals or members of the Curia who knew him um, that he opened up the secret in the presence of Cardinal Ottaviani and certain others, um, read it, and then put it away in an archive in the Vatican and said, basically, um, this prophecy is, is not meant for our times. It can't be for us. Um, why do I bring this up? It's because... Let's say Pope John the Twenty Third was a very optimistic character, and he was convinced that the modern world was was more open to Christ than ever before, and that all we need to do is call the bishops of the world together and manifest our Catholic unity and the beauty of our Catholic religion, and uh, the world's just going to buy it all up. Everyone's going to love it, um, and so he was convinced that everything was going to go well. There was no need to condemn errors, um, but simply to um, express the deposit of faith. Um, in language which is more pastoral, understandable to modern man. Um, so in this speech, I'll just quote a few lines from it. Um, he says, first of all, we believe we ought to disassociate ourselves entirely from these prophets of doom who are constantly predicting the worst. According to them, contemporary society would lead to nothing but ruin and calamity. And so who are these prophets of doom? Well, it, it's a matter of conjecture. One important 
conjecture that's been put out there is that he's referring especially to the shepherd children of Fatima and, and the prophecy of Our Lady contained in the third secret about evils that were about to afflict the church. Of course, that's just speculation, but what's clear is that he is convinced that everything is going to be great. Uh, we'll see if that's actually true or not. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to um, not have my face completely show my my horror at that again this is conjecture this is you know this is but it's it's very probable um that this is what he's referring to in the fact that he's mm-hmm. referring to a, a marian apparition as a prophet of doom almost just saying and hey, not not a huge deal i mean again totally yes. putting words in, words in his mouth here but mm-hmm. Uh, well, it's, it, it really is a mystery of iniquity how it's possible that um, the popes would have been able to uh, ignore the request of Our Lady to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. And even we're talking about some very good popes like Pius XI, Pius XII, um, who otherwise were, were excellent. Uh, Pius XII, for example, consecrated the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but omitted the, the mention of Russia. Um, right. So even before um, Pope John XXIII, you have this un- unfortunate phenomenon where where the popes they they to a greater or lesser extent um, pay homage to Our Lady of Fatima and promote the cult of, of Fatima but they aren't very obedient in complying with Our Lady's request right. um, and if that was the case with great popes like Pius XII what are you going to expect with one like John the Twenty Third who who as we're going to see is um, some kind of a uh, moderate liberal Right. Um, not certainly not as liberal as as many of the council of fathers at the time, but but he was a kind of um, pope who always wanted to find the middle ground between his opposing factions, and so he he kind of toe the line between modernism and the church's traditional teaching. Right, he was at the very least open to these ideas. For sure. Right. For sure. Well, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you, Father. Go ahead with, uh, oh, with the rest okay. of of the opening no, statement so, there. So, anyways, uh, point number one is that. Pope John the Twenty Third is is saying we want to have nothing to do with these prophets of doom. Um, humanity is in fact progressing towards bigger and better things, um, as he said. Humanity appears to enter a new order of things. <laughs> what exactly this new order is, uh, hard to say, um, but he's convinced that it's something very positive. Um, the second point in his speech is that well, the objective of this council. Um, is to present, um, let's say, the, the sure and unchangeable doctrine of the church, um, but according to the methods demanded by modern day thought. And, and Pope John makes this distinction, a very well, dubious distinction, um, that the deposit of faith, and I, I'm quoting him literally, the deposit of faith is one thing, but the way it is presented is something quite different. In our teachings, we must have recourse to a style of presentation that is especially pastoral. So two things there. One, Mm -hmm. uh, we're saying that um, we can change the way that we present the faith, and that's okay because the deposit of faith remains the same. Um, It sounds nice in theory, but in practice, once you start presenting the faith in a radically different way, that's going to lead to differences in belief. Um, But but moving on beyond that, uh, he also uses the word pastoral which is going to be like a buzzword in the council. And everyone is going to be using this word pastoral, pastoral, pastoral. What does it actually mean? It's never defined, of course. Um, But it's going to be a tool for um, introducing especially very dangerous ambiguities into the council on the pretext that, well, um, we're not speaking to theologians here or using the terminology of of scholastic theology. Rather, we want to make what we're going to say presentable to modern man. And so we have to use this kind of ambiguity ambiguous pastoral language. Quickly, just to to slip in the third and last point Mm -hmm. that's worth mentioning here, and it has reference to the first two. Um, Because everything is great in in the world and in the church at large, there's no need to issue condemnations of error. Um, And also, because we wish to be pastoral and our focus is not to define the truth, there's no need for um, definitions or, on the other hand, condemnations. So Pope John says, rather than condemning, the church better responds to the needs of our age by emphasizing the wealth of her doctrine. So, so basically, there's, there's no need to be so severe with everything in this council because there's nothing bad happening. Again, I'm, I'm overly simplifying things. Sure. Uh, there's nothing mm-hmm. bad happening, so we don't need to be super severe about things. We can just be pastoral and talk about God's mercy and love which exists, but we don't need to focus on judgment or condemnation. 
Exactly. Okay. So this kind of sets the tone then for, I mean, we're looking way ahead now, but this kind of sets the tone not only for the council, Father, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to set the tone then for the entire Catholic Church for the rest of the 50 years, 60 years since then. Well, sure, of course. The emphasis is always going to be on those, especially those aspects of our religion that man might find comforting or consoling. We'll talk a lot about God's goodness, his mercy, his love, um, but we're going to silence all, all things which can be, in some sense, negative or make us uncomfortable. Um, God's justice, uh, the, the, the evils of, of heresy and schism, um, and uh, let's say judgment, death, hell, purgatory, anything which would cause discomfort, especially to modern man, and make religion seem like something burdensome or odious to him. Uh, those things we're going to, uh, let's say, overlook or, or omit to mention out of this spirit of um, being pastoral, <laughs> right. but obviously not pastoral in the true sense of the word. Right. That uh, makes sense. So, so these are the opening statements that Pope John XXIII gives. Um, and then as we get into the council, uh, we will see some of the, I guess, intrigue starting to happen. Is that the right word I guess I could use? Yes, exactly. I mean, it's true that always throughout the history, history of the church, um, her councils have been subject to uh, maneuvers or intrigues of one sort or another. Um, it's Let's say that's just an inevitable... Uh, aspect of, of the humanity of the church, the fact that uh, the leaders of the church are men. And so, of course, it's natural that there will be certain differences in opinion and, and people are going to form in organizations around uh, their, their own set of opinions. For example, in the First Vatican Council, you had groups that were in favor of the definition of papal infallibility and others that were not. Um, and sometimes, let's say, the division is a very deep one. Sometimes it's it's not so much on a matter of doctrine as on a matter of prudence. Like uh, with the First Vatican Council, the question wasn't really, is the Pope infallible, but rather, is it opportune here and now to define that he's right. infallible? Um, the problem with these... Um, let's say, divisions and then these maneuverings in the council is that um, one of the groups and the one that's most powerful and influential and, and successful in its maneuverings is trying to not merely advance a certain prudential position like we should or should not define this thing um, at this exact moment, but rather it's trying to subvert the council, subvert Catholic doctrine and introduce new ideas that are, are born of the French Revolution and don't belong to the teaching of the Catholic Church. And we're going to see in the first few sessions of the council um, how this group, which in itself is relatively small, only comprising about 10% of the council fathers, it's going to successfully take control of the direction in which the council goes, um, thanks in part to its own superior organization. Um, we were saying earlier that the council came as, as a surprise to the Catholic world, and most of the, the bishops who came to the council really had no idea um, what this was all about or what they should expect. Whereas uh, it was it was really the liberals and just the liberals who already had a predefined agenda and things that they wanted to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And they saw this as the opportunity that they'd waited many years for to finally um, have an impact on the church at large. So it's the liberals, what we call the Rhine Group or the European Alliance, um, who came to the council uh, far better prepared than anyone else um, with their own strong internal organization. And because of this, even though they were numerically a minority, they were able to have a disproportionately great influence upon the proceedings of the council. So could we take a moment just then, Father, to look at how a council is is organized? Um, there's there's commissions and then there are members in commissions. Uh, how does how does that work, Father? Because I, I guess that's, that's going to play a, an important part in, in what we're talking about. You have a number of different commissions whose members are, let's say, initially, uh, some of them are appointed by the Pope himself. But ultimately, at the beginning of the council, the, the members of the commission are voted upon by all the council fathers. And so, let's say the, the Pope had already set up the preparatory commission to write the, the drafts of the council documents. Um, but once the council actually started, the first thing that needed to be, to, to be done was for the council fathers to approve of the list of, of council fathers who would form these commissions. And each commission was responsible for producing a council document that would then be debated upon by the council fathers and finally submitted to a vote to be rejected or approved. The first thing that the council fathers had to do was to um, 
decide who would be the members of these commissions because obviously they would be the most influential persons in the council. They would be the ones writing the texts. So the, the council fathers were given the names of all the prelates who had worked on the preparatory commission. And it was to be expected that most of these men would be approved for the council commissions because they, they were already known to be experts in their field and they'd already worked on the preparatory documents. Um, but what we see in the first session of the council is that in, in the very first uh, meeting of the, the general congregation, one of the liberal cardinals, Cardinal Leonard, he, he rises up and protests against these lists of potential commission members that have been handed out to all the council fathers, saying that there's not enough uh, representation of bishops or uh, council fathers internationally. Most of these men are, are members of the Roman Curia, and, and there's not a, a sufficiently broad representation of the bishops of the world. That was, let's say, his pretext for saying um, what we need to do is to scrap these lists and give all the council fathers time to draw up their own lists of who they think should be on these commissions, kind of starting from scratch. And in fact, all the council fathers are going to propose lists uh, based upon their own nationality. Each nation is going to collaborate in, in preparing its own list. And uh, I'm looking at some of the notes that you had passed me before we started talking about this father. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting at, at the top of the podcast, Our Lady of Fatima comes up uh, very prominently. Um, and I'm looking at the date that this vote happened and where this uh, this protest happened by Cardinal Leonard. Uh, and it's October 13th. So, I mean, Absolutely. maybe I'm just reading into things, Father. I don't know. But mm -hmm. that seems like something, maybe. <laughs> yes, well, this is certainly the beginning of the end. <laughs> Whatever good may have been accomplished by the council, it was really um, overturned or kind of nipped in the bud here because um, what's about to happen is the the preparatory commissions, which had been staffed by generally very sound good theologians, they're, they're about to be disbanded and all of these liberals are going to be placed on the, the council's commissions. And because they have also the Pope's sympathy, that's an important thing, is that the Pope was good friends with certain of these members of the Rhine group, such as Cardinal Swenens, for example, um, who had just been created a cardinal by Pope John the XXIII. Um, there, were, there was these personal friendships that were already formed, and so the Pope was very sympathetic to their requests. And he ended up approving 88 of the 109 candidates that they proposed. So in other words, they got almost everything that they wanted. And these 88 candidates formed more than 30% of the, the total number of council fathers on the commission. So they were able to achieve a, a disproportionately great representation in the drafting of the schemata. Because again, the, the Rhine group, they only numerically constituted about 10% of the council, but their members constituted more than 30% of the conciliar commissions. Wow. So this is a, this is a big victory for the liberal wing, for the, for the Rhine group um, already, just Absolutely. in the opening days of the council. All right. So uh, as then the first, the first uh, session of the council uh, continues, um, what do we see happen? Are there things that were discussed or things that were passed? Sure. So let's say that the first um, objective of the Rhine group was to get their own members on the conciliar commissions. Their next yes. objective was to block the preparatory schemata, um, which they didn't like because these these uh, documents were far too traditional and conservative. And so how did they do that? Well, um, their, their tactic was to postpone discussion of these schemata, except for the, the one which they found to be more or less acceptable, which, which, which was the one on the liturgy, which was, let's say, the, the liturgical commission um, was the one preparatory commission that did have a number of liberal members on it, um, including very significantly um, Father Bunini, uh, or, or perhaps he was Monsignor at the time, I'd have to check. Anyways, Bunini, he was the architect of the liturgical reforms of 1955, so the Holy Week reforms, as well as the 1962 reforms. Um, and he was eventually going to be the architect of the new mass. And uh, years later, it would be discovered that, in fact, he was a Freemason. His, his name would be published in the list of, of Italian Freemasons, and this would uh, result in him being expelled from his, his official positions that he held at the Vatican. Um, but anyways, at the time, he was an undercover Freemason, um, and he was the secretary of the, the liturgical commission. 
And so of all the preparatory schemata, this one on the liturgy was the one that was the most acceptable to the liberals. And so their tactic was, well, let's let's talk about this one first, because it's already got a lot that we like and that we can work with. And we're just going to postpone for now discussion of the other documents, which will ultimately result in them being ignored or overturned. Wow. So basically, the, the first session of the council ends with not a lot happening. It kind of ends with, I don't want to say a whimper, but nothing is really happening uh, in this sure. first session. Um, in fact, that, that's absolutely right. So not a single uh, document is approved by the end of the first session. All that's been done is to change the, the members of the commissions uh, and to begin discussion of the document on the liturgy. But that's it. And, and for the Liberal Party, that was a great victory um, because they obtained their two objectives. One was to get their own men on the commissions, and the second objective was to um, eventually uh, reject altogether the preparatory schemata. But, but they, in order to do that, they had to kind of um, use an, an indirect approach, just simply delaying discussion of these things and focusing on the one um, document which was acceptable to them. So, so the, the council is, is on pause until the next session then, which would be in, in 1963. Uh, but before mm -hmm. that happens, uh, I'm sure there's still discussion, there's still things happening, various bishops are going home, and uh, were there meetings informal or formally among some of these council fathers about what would be happening and, and taking place? Absolutely, um, especially the German-speaking bishops. So they were uh, uh -huh. the most active in, in planning for the, the next session of the council. And they held two major meetings um, between the first and second sessions to uh, produce alternative schemas uh, so that when they come back for the next session, um, they can say, you know what, w over the, the, the course of the year, while we were waiting for the, the second session, we've elaborated these alternative schemas, which are in fact much more in line with Pope John the 23rd had asked for at the beginning of the council. They're more, let's say, open to the, the ways of thought of modern man. Um, and, and so why don't we vote on, let's say, substituting these for for the original uh, documents prepared by the by the um, preparatory commission, are, are they taking the um, the schemas that were already existing and then just reforming them, or are they completely saying let's let's do something new, something totally different that wasn't even discussed in the uh, in the preparatory schemas? These documents that the German speaking bishops prepared um, for for the beginning of the second session. They were written, for the most part, um, by Father Rahner, who's one of the leading uh -huh. liberal theologians. In fact, he's really, uh, let's say, the most influential of all the theologians in the Second Vatican Council. Um, and so he was really behind all of these documents, which were to be proposed during the second session as alternatives to the original documents. And this is the same Father Rahner that we were talking about with Father Bormeau just a couple episodes ago when talking about de Lubac and the new theology. So this is the same Father Rahner. Who's this is now. the same Father Karl Rahner, exactly. I believe it said that Cardinal Ottaviani, secretary of the Holy Office um, under Pius XII, and, and even during this time as well, he um, had approached Pope Pius XII, I believe it's a total of five times, to ask for the excommunication of Father Karl Rahner because his uh, teachings were so heretical. Um, and, and it's this priest, this theologian, who is going to be the most influential of all the, the council fathers at the Second Vatican Council. He's also, interestingly enough, um, Pope Benedict XVI's mentor at the time, uh, so Cardinal Ratzinger. He was, uh, at the time, fa Father Ratzinger, and he was working under Karl Rahner as, as one of his protégés at the Second Vatican Council. And again, not, not to go back in our, in our podcast history here, uh, but again, talking with, with Father Bormeau about this, uh, he, had, he had proposed, you know, probably one of the humani generis by Pope Pius XII that, that condemned mm -hmm. this new theology. He was saying, you know, it's, it's a great document, but if I could say that there's one thing wrong with it, it's that he didn't explicitly name who these people were. And, and he probably should have, you know, looking at Monday morning, Monday morning quarterback here. Uh, but I wonder what would have <laughs> happened if he had named Rahner in there. It, maybe things would be different. Sure. I don't know. Sure. It, it is unfortunate. There seems to be perhaps a certain weakness in 
um, Pope Pius XII, uh, an unwillingness to condemn individuals, um, and in general, a reluctance to pass judgment on people. Um, we, we see that, for example, he left many important um, positions in the Roman Curia vacant. Um, he appointed very few cardinals, and so after his death, Pope John XXIII, in, in the four or five years that he was pope, he was able to um, appoint, let's say, uh, such a large number of cardinals that by the time that he died and it was time for the new pope to be elected, um, the majority of the cardinals were ones that he himself had personally elected in those four or five years of his pontificate. Um, and that's precisely because Pope Pius XII had been very reluctant to make judgments about persons, to say, um, I think you're good and so I'm going to promote you to be a cardinal, or to, to say, I think you, that you're causing trouble and you need to be punished. Uh -huh. So Pope John the Twenty Third, he passes away then shortly after this. Yes, in fact, uh, now that we're we're talking about the um, the events that that come between the first and second sessions, um, there are these meetings of the German speaking bishops preparing for the second session. But also, uh, even more importantly, perhaps, is the death of Pope John the Twenty Third on June third, nineteen sixty three, um, and this, of course, results in the election of. Paul the the sixth, who is going to, um, let's say, have a very very definitive influence on the direction of the rest of the council, um, more or less in continuity with what Pope John the twenty third had already started. But we can say that Pope Paul the sixth is uh, even more convinced of of the liberal ideas that Pope John the twenty third had kind of played with. Uh, and, and he's going to, moreover, change some of the rules of procedure for the way that the council operates in, in a way that's going to favor the Liberal, the liberal Party greatly. Um, for example, he's going to give control of the council to four cardinal moderators, all four of whom were, were liberals. And they were ones that the Pope, Pope Paul VI, himself directly appointed. It wasn't put up to a vote for the Council Fathers to decide upon. Um, it was he, by his own authority, decided, I'm going to appoint these four cardinal moderators, and they're going to kind of run the day-to-day -day business of the Council, and therefore they're going to have an enormous influence on its direction. Um, that's, uh, you, can, you can start to see how it's all falling into place very, very quickly, Absolutely. all things considered. If you don't mind, um, just before we close, though, um, yeah. I might quote briefly a, a very, let's say, illustrative incident from the towards the end of the first session of the council in which we see the maneuvering of the, the Liberal Party um, in a very symbolic gesture. Uh, it's, it's the time when Cardinal Ottaviani, he is um, coming forward to speak on the subject of the the schema on the liturgy, which is proposing all these radical changes to the mass. He comes forward to protest these changes to say, um, hold on, the mass is a very sacred thing that we can't just tweak or, or change at, at our pleasure. Um, and he's addressing the entire council on this very important subject, but he starts to run over his time limit. And uh, so I'll just quote this from uh, Father Wilchen's uh, book. I could be mispronouncing his name, but anyways, it's The, the Rhine Flows Into the Tiber, um, a, a very famous book on the history of the Second Vatican Council. Um, so, so Father Wilchen says, um, on October 30th, the day after his 72nd birthday, Cardinal Ottaviani addressed the council to protest against the drastic changes which were being suggested in the Mass. Are we seeking to stir up wonder, or perhaps scandal, among the Christian people by introducing changes in so venerable a rite that has been approved for so many centuries and is now so familiar? The rite of Holy Mass should not be treated as if it were a piece of cloth to be refashioned according to the whim of each generation. Speaking without a text because of his partial blindness, he exceeded the ten-minute limit which all had been requested to observe. Cardinal Tisserant, Dean of the Council Presidents, showed his watch to Cardinal Alfrink, who was presiding that morning. When Cardinal Ottaviani reached 15 minutes, Cardinal Alfrink rang the warning bell. But the speaker was so engrossed in his topic that he did not notice the bell or purposely ignored it. At a signal from Cardinal Alfrink, a technician switched off the microphone. After confirming the fact by tapping the instrument, Cardinal Ottaviani stumbled back to his seat in humiliation. The most powerful cardinal in the Roman Curia had been silenced and the council fathers clapped with glee. 
so it's a very sinister moment in which the, the, the most important of the cardinals and the one who's the secretary of the Holy Office um, is, is silenced in the middle of, of, of his address to the council. It's very humiliating for him. Um, it shows, let's say, that the, the other cardinals who are moderating the discussion, uh, they're, they're not interested in giving him um, time and freedom to speak. And at the same time, there's this, this nasty kind of outburst of applause um, when the poor cardinal is, is cut off in the middle of, of his speech and realizes that um, he's no longer able to be heard because they've turned the microphone off on him. Um, and, and I believe it's Professor De Matei in his book on the Second Vatican Council points out that, in fact, the applause that resulted then was not, let's say, a general applause of the whole assembly, but rather it was coming from a very specific part of the Council Fathers where, where no doubt the Rhine Group or European Alliance was, was clustered. Um, and they were the ones who were so pleased to see this humiliation of Cardinal Ottaviani, who for them was a great enemy because he represented an, an unswerving commitment to the Church's uh, doctrinal traditions. Well, well, if that doesn't tell you the tenor of the council there, I, I don't know what does. <laughs> exactly. Right. So I suppose that would be the bottom line then of this first session is that there's a lot of, sure, uh, political and diplomatic maneuvering, um, which results in an initial defeat for, um, let's say, the conservatives and Catholic tradition. And especially it makes manifest that it's the liberals who are the most powerful, the best organized, and who look like they're going to take control of the council. Very good. Well, Father, thank you for your time. I'm looking forward to diving into uh, the second session with you next time. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to and watching episode 19 of our Crisis in the Church series here on the SSPX podcast. In episode 20, we're going to welcome back Father McGilvery to review what happened in the second and third sessions of the Council, two of the most momentous periods of the Church's 20th century. We'll also look at the problems with the ambiguity in conciliar statements, and we will learn what a neo-modernist time bomb is. If you have a question on the topic of the crisis, please feel free to ask it at sspxpodcast.com slash crisis. Please share this episode with someone who you think might enjoy it. And if they don't know what a podcast is, please show them so that they can take advantage of all our episodes. And if you have the ability to set up a monthly recurring donation of 5 or 10 or $20 on sspxpodcast.com, it would help us immensely to complete this Crisis in the Church project. Until next week, thank you for listening, and God bless you.